of all, I want to say how um, honored and, and pleased that we are at the Central Proctor Oyster Program to be uh, able to share with you at the Civic Media Center. We really value this institution, this building, this place. And if it is your first time visiting, please take time to look around. This incredible collection of books. Um, many of you know that Stetson Kennedy um, was a dear friend of, of, of Gainesville, progressive Gainesville. And Stetson actually donated his library to the Civic Media Center. When I think of the Civic Media Center in the context of the Civil Rights Movement, I think about the Freedom House. Now, the Freedom House would be the place that the SNCC organizers and local people would, would kind of chart out or stake out as being a safe place. A house, it could be someone's residence, it could be the back of a grocery store, uh, it could be a warehouse. But the idea behind the Freedom House was it was a place that people got together and studied and learned and interacted on uh, conditions of, of racial equality which in a state like Mississippi was kind of tough to do in the early Mississippi. So I really value the CMC and I want to thank Bobby for hosting this program. I wanted to start by uh, the students asked me to pass this brochure around and it's a brochure that tells different stories. And one of the stories is it gives you an overview of what we do at UF World History, but the photograph itself is from our first ever um, student Mississippi camp, which we held here uh, three or four years ago. And it has a picture on the front of Cambria Clark, uh, Candace Ellis, and Marta Weston. And uh, Cambria uh, went with us to the Delta, I believe, three times, Candace three times, and Marta four times. And it's, I really like the picture because in the background you see the books, but in the foreground you see how much fun we're having uh, in, in talking about Mississippi. Um, I was asked to just talk a little bit about why we go to Mississippi every fall um, and to also talk a little bit about the, the, the students. I think they want me to introduce you uh, without revealing too much information. Um, but the reason we go to Mississippi every fall is, is well, this, this is one of the reasons. This is a photograph of Lawrence Eon. Uh, shortly after he was beaten nearly to death in a small jail in Winona, Mississippi. And I'll just pass this around, you can look at it. You can see the scars, um, the welts on his body. Lawrence Dion was the founding chair of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. This was the most important independent political party in American history. It organized eventually over 100,000 African Americans in the state of Mississippi, it included leaders like Fannie Lou Hamer. I know many of you have heard about him. And it completely changed American politics in many different ways. One way is that when you look at the Democratic and Republican conventions, and you look at who represents those political parties, you will see that women play a very important role in the Democratic and Republican parties. Before the Mississippi challenge, before the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, Neither political party, neither the Democrats nor the Republicans, tried to integrate women into their political kind of interior, if you will. The Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party demanded that both political parties open up, open themselves up to minorities and to women. And that had, this had a lasting change in American politics if you accept the notion that we should have representation along the lines of, of, of race and sex. The Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, Lawrence Giot, the other thing they did was they were instrumental behind the passage of the Voting Rights Act. The Voting Rights Act is the single most important piece of American legislation since World War I, since the passage of women's suffrage. It guarantees us equal rights to vote. And that, the passage of that, that measure that Lawrence Giot was beaten for, that Fannie Lou Hamer was beaten for, that Cheney Goodman and Shorner were murdered for, many people in Mississippi lost their lives for, that came out of the civil rights struggle. And these are some of the reasons why every fall, UF oral history goes to Mississippi. Now, I was asked, how did we end up going there in the first place? I started doing field work there when I was a graduate student at Duke University in the early 1990s. And I interviewed people like Bernice White and Rosalind Dorsey White. They were foot soldiers in the civil rights movement. You probably have never heard their names, but they're the people that work behind the scenes. Uh, Dorsey White was the person who made sure 
that the SNCC organizers always had gas in their vehicles. He owned gas stations. He was an African American a landowner. He made sure that those vehicles, as people were doing voting rights work, freedom school work, um, Head Start work, he made sure that the vehicles had gas. You know, that the cars ran, right? He would fix your car for free to help you get down the road. Um, Bernice White, I interviewed her in the summer of 1995. She passed away a few years after that. But her daughter, uh, Stacy White, called me when her mother passed away and said, Paul, um, I want you to come back to Mississippi and do more oral history work. And so I started coming back year after year. When I moved to the University of Florida, uh, Stacy called me and I said, hey, instead of just me coming by myself, why don't I bring like eight or 10 students? You know, the multiplier effect, they can do more oral history work. And so she said, sure, let's give it a try. Now, I, when I pick students to go to Mississippi, I have to pick the best students that the University of Florida has to offer. And you're going to see an example of four of those best students. But I'm putting my reputation as a moral story on the line, and I'm also putting the reputation of the university on the line as well. And so I think you're going to hear tonight that these students demonstrate to you why they, are this, the, the, why they were picked to go to Mississippi. But the third thing I'll say with this project is that we have made some amazing friends. And when I think of Lawrence Eon, who you see going around in that photograph, Lawrence Eon just passed away. Uh, a few months ago. He was uh, 75, and he was a legend in the civil rights movement, and yet he spent time with us, he sat down with us. And I know that, um, um, Diana, you remember the organizing workshop, and we're going to see a clip from that in a few minutes. But imagine, uh, someone asked me, uh, actually a fellow historian, uh, and Yale said, how on earth did your group make a connection with someone as famous a legendary as Lawrence Eon. And I said, it's the students. The students are the ones who really build the bridges. Um, when you think of someone like Lawrence Eon, imagine it's about 30 or 40 years, 30 or 40 years after the American Revolution, and you strike up a relationship with someone like Thomas Paine. That's how important Lawrence Eon was to, to the civil rights people. That's the, and the reason he was important is, is this. He was a great organizer. He would come to you and he would ask you, how are you doing now? Um, and he would pay respect to you and homage to you. And he would find out what it was you were really good at doing. And so if he would if 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 say, Emily, I've heard you are an outstanding student. You're a really good writer. And I just want to say that I really appreciate the fact that you're such a great writer. And, um, he would find out who you were. He would meet you where you were at. Uh, and then he kind of give you a little self-confidence about your skills. And then he would put you to work. Right? And he was such a great organizer. He cared how he felt. And it didn't matter how big he became. Uh, when he passed away, we were very honored to uh, be able to share these, these clips uh, with people at the, there was a major celebration for his, um, in honor of his life in Washington, D.C. Uh, there was one in Indianola, there was one in Jackson. So a lot of University of Florida oral history material went into those celebrations, videos, photographs, uh, oral history testimony, and other things. So what I'm going to do now is just really introduce the students. Then we're going to play a clip uh, from Lawrence Fiat, and then they're going to go directly into their presentation. Uh, first here, we have Diana Dabrowski. Diana graduated from the University of Florida last year. Uh, she graduated with honors. Uh, she wrote a wonderful senior thesis um, on the Peace Corps. Uh, next, we have Jessica Taylor. Jessica Taylor is currently a history uh, PhD student. She's going to change the way we think about Bacon's Rebellion uh, in, in the year before the American Revolution. Uh, next, we have John Joseph, who currently is a intern at the uh, oral history program um, and made her first trip to Mississippi, did a wonderful job. Um, and then at uh, the very end, we have a radio star. Uh, <laughs> Justin, none of them was actually on a radio today, recorded. And Justin, that program is going to play when? 
Luke said Sunday morning between 7.30 and 8, so if you guys are hungry birds on Sunday, which I am not. <laughs> <laughs> and it's at 101? Uh, yeah, Magic 101. Magic 101, and he was on the program today, had a Justin as a, his, a, a anthropology uh, PhD candidate, uh, and, he, and just finished uh, his first draft of his MA thesis. Uh, the last thing I'll, I'll mention to you, and we will mention this at the very end, is uh, we have a number of really exciting public programs coming up. One is tomorrow uh, at noon at King Hall on campus of UF. Uh, Billy Townsend, who's written a wonderful book on the struggle against the Ku Klux Klan in Black and Putnam County, is going to be speaking tomorrow at King Hall about his book. Um, you'll see count, uh, brochures out front about Alan Rosen, who has written an incredible book about the first ever oral history interviews done with Holocaust survivors. And that's going to be February 12th. And then uh, another event we have coming, uh, 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 my former undergraduate advisor, Stephanie Coons, who's going to come and speak to us in March about her incredible work on Betty Friedan, a uh, book called The Strange Story. And so that's coming in March. Uh, so without further delay, we'll turn it over to the panel and you're going to see a clip of uh, Lawrence Dion. I can't think of a more important way to spend your time. Because Paul is going to lead you into an analysis of this history that cannot be refuted, that is accurate, that is compelling, and that should be directional in how you spend your life. You have two options. You can either get a good college degree, get you a good job, and never really extend yourself as far as empowering and advancing the cause of other people. Their people, organizers, have a special frame of reference. Organizers never organize simply for themselves. Organizers have to have a purpose and a strategy and a timetable. If you come and ask somebody to register to vote and learn how to <coughs> register other people, then the next question is where are we going with that? Don't let the other step create itself, you have to have it in your mind. Now, between now and 2012, we have to put thousands of organizers into every department we can, every community we can. If we left this room right now and went and selected 10 corners, and Paul decided what corners we would go to, we would find leadership in every one of those corners. Leadership is the ability to convince people that they should do what you want and it's in their benefit to do it. And that you understand it's in their benefit to do it. Now, there's another truism about organizing. Once a person makes something happen, they can never be the same person again. Because once they've made something happen, no one else can persuade them that they can't do that. They have the most firm proof possible. I did it. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter how significant, doesn't matter how many, what, what are the ramifications. And then we get a chance to talk to them. Because after, the day after someone has made something happen, they don't wait for, they, they look around and say, well, what do I need to do today? And then we got them. Because the power of people to transform their lives and the lives of everyone that they come in contact with is immense. We, there were less than 200 people in SNCC. And I, I want you to understand, in my opinion, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was the most successful organizing group in America. It compares with the abolitionists, the suffragettes, the founding fathers. Da -da 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 -da. Because what it did, it took a simple proposition that ordinary people can do astounding things. Sunflower County is a good example of that. Ordinary people were faced with terror and the promise of terror. The relationship between political activity uh, and terror was immediate. Make your choice. If we can destroy you, we will do that. If we have to drive you out, we will do it. If we burn your house, whatever, we will do that. And yet people said uh, there's, no, there's no non, number one. People came to understand that there were no non-political decisions. That if they wanted to bring about change, they had to bring. Roy Wilkins' position on organizing 
in Mississippi was, he said, anyone who tries to organize is crazy. We're going to raise money on, on the terror there. We're going to sell memberships. We're going to uh, propagandize the terror of Mississippi, but we're not going to organize. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee said, there are people organizing there. There's E.W. Steptoe. Hartman Perrinbow would lay down there. And this wonderful giant called Fannie Lou Hamer. Uh, and so what we did was say, okay, what we need to do is rely on the resilience, the tenacity, the church, and the extended family. Imagine what it is to live through slavery, then be faced with the black codes for the next 50 years. Imagine the kind of resilience it took to keep families together, to keep each other together, to keep believing that a greater day is coming. So what we did was give them the power to bring that day about. Uh, the whole Mississippi was organized along rigid lines. Everything that existed in Mississippi was to pr promote self white supremacy. Every police officer you met was white. Every elected official was white. The sovereignty commission was designed and paid by taxpayers' money to maintain segregation at all costs. Uh, there is nothing more compelling than to look at the history of Mississippi, then look at the history of Mississippi now. We couldn't hold this meeting 20 years ago, but today, hey, along with that opportunity comes responsibility. I am charging each one of you with the responsibility of learning the power of organizing and the universality of organizing. All right. Um, on that note, <laughs> uh, this clip was filmed during a workshop when I was a senior and I went to Mississippi for the first time. Uh, we stayed in a hotel in Cleveland, Mississippi, and then uh, when we went down to breakfast, we just got to listen to community organizers talk to us. That was one of the most fantastic parts about this whole trip, was that everyone we met really had something to say and really wanted to teach us, and that's what we did this last year, too. We got to gather with Alan Bean, the founder of Friends of, Friends of Justice, with Dr. Gwendolyn Sahara Simmons, who teaches at the University of Florida and also worked with SNCC and the Black Panther Party for some time. Everyone had really great things to say, and it was a fantastic opportunity for all of us to learn at the University of Florida to meet these people. We traveled from Gainesville, we went them, I mean, we met them, and then we came home. But what I wanted to talk about today was the legacy that Spock is leaving in Mississippi, or is trying to leave. When we went to the Delta last year, <clears throat> we conducted oral history interviews, as Dr. Ortiz mentioned, but we also put on an event at Delta State University to talk about the history of Fannie Lou Hamer and community organizing in general. So that's something that we tried to do to the with the community in Mississippi that we were going into. But we also put this event on and did these interviews with school kids from Mississippi, from a home high school. They toured the historic sites that we went to, like where Emmett Till was murdered, and where they found his body, and where the museum in his honor is today. They went on all of these trips with us. And when we got back, a couple weeks later, we were contacted by their teacher. She was filming a documentary with her kids about the history of civil rights organizing in Southwest Mississippi. And they had been so inspired by what they had got to do with us that they wanted to share it with the rest of their school. So as a result, we had them, you know, come along on our trip and that sort of thing and film stuff for their documentary. But they really turned it into something much bigger. So this event that Dr. Ortiz and I will be going to in February was put on entirely by everyone at McComb High School. The kids are organizing everything. And it's going to consist of a tour of civil rights sites in southwest Mississippi, a panel for everyone at the school, and also the screening of their new documentary. So it's really exciting for us to be able to go there 
and see what the work we did inspired other people to do. So for me as a student going to Mississippi and being able to learn from these community organizers really inspires me to find direction in my life related to that. But it's very gratifying for all of us at SPOP to see the opportunities that we're given inspire things in other people too. So that is actually <laughs> the biggest news that I have, but it's really exciting for us because we're having really cool guests like the first state civil rights museum in the United States. Um, it's going to open in 2017 in Mississippi, and the director of that museum is going to be attending this event in February. It's really put on entirely by the kids who are excited by what we're doing, and I'm so proud of that. I wanted to share it with everyone. This is our fifth year, and this is something really big, so I'm really proud of us, and I'm way more proud of them, too. So it's really exciting. Yeah. Um, you talk about the school. Are you saying this is a high school, right? Yes. Yeah, it's a public yeah, high school. It's a public high school? It is. And so, uh, what's the percent of white to black? I really don't know that. Um, I don't, I never asked that question. Is it 60-40? Okay, it's 60-40. Oh, um, <laughs> to which? Black to white. 60 to black. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, one of the things that Sarah and I actually noticed when we were in the lobby of this hotel just waiting, you know, to hear more awesome, inspiring workshops, we picked up a pamphlet of public schools, like local high school sort of information. And we got to see the pictures of all the football teams, because it was a roster that was posted to promote the public for the city sort of thing. But it was split entirely along color lines, just like that. So one picture of a high school and their team was entirely white. And one picture of another school, and their team was entirely black. So I brought it, <laughs> and then they passed it around. Yes. So, favorite artifact. Yeah. <laughs> so that is um, another one of the things that these kids like really have to deal with in their school is this real legacy of failure in you know, the work that some people had hoped to accomplish. There are a lot of things, I mean, the state of education, for example, in Mississippi isn't perfect. But we really learned from all the community organizers that we talked to how important it was to continue that work and always to keep going and to keep trying. So this is really concrete proof that I'm gonna pass around of why that needs to continue. But especially what the students are doing at Macomb that's received such good response from academics and all that sort of thing um, is proof of the power that they still have. Yeah. Um, that museum you're talking about yeah. is civil rights museum. Um, mm -hmm. So is that going to be like the first established permanent building? No, there's the National Civil Rights Museum that's in Memphis, Tennessee, and we actually had the director of that museum come to our panel at Delta State University <laughs> to talk. So where's but this new one? Up this one is going to be, I think it's in South Mississippi as well. It's going to be in Jackson. Oh, it's Jackson. Okay. It's going to be in Jackson, but it's going to be the first one that's funded through a state, and the fact that it's funded by Mississippi is really interesting, too, given the history of Subjects there. So, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I can uh, go next if you want. Yeah, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> back to you. Yeah. Um, well, uh, this was my first year going to Mississippi, and one of the really great things um, that I enjoyed was the fact that we could sort of go anywhere. And I'm one of those people I really like to explore old buildings and um, you know, go through the woods and stuff like that. And um, I got a chance to do that um, in a sort of interesting way when we went to the um, Sunflower County Freedom Project, which is an after-school program in Sunflower, Mississippi, which is a small town of about 600, um, 400 of which are black. Um, and uh, over 60% of their population lives under the property line or on welfare. Um, and the, the Freedom Project was founded by AmeriCorps um, in 2000, and what they do is they provide a place for kids to go after school, but also learn the power of expression, um, writing, 
Um, they have hip hop club, they have poetry club, they have gardening club, um, and you can kind of do whatever you want or you can start your own club, it's really up to you. Um, and it's mostly middle schoolers and high schoolers and it's one of the best chances for those kids to go to college. Um, they've sent kids to Ole Miss, but they've also sent kids to Chapel Hill and Berea, um, and all of these kids are African American. Um, and the way that the high schools work in Sunflower County is, I'm sure you'll see it when you look at that um, pamphlet that's going around, is traditionally white children go to private Christian academies, and the people that can't afford them, which are the African American families, end up in the public schools, which don't get the same tax base. Um, so um, this is one of the chances that they get to prepare for college. Um, and the building is actually, and then I brought a picture of it, um, this in downtown Sunflower, which used to be um, a lot more of a, of a hop in place um, <laughs> during the 1960s. Um, it, this was a, the town center, and it's a strip of buildings that was built between 1890s and the 1920s. Um, so um, one of my interests in school is historic preservation. And um, there's this really great Alleluia quote um, that um, the tools we have can either be a shovel or an axe to either um, destroy or plant something new. And historic preservation provides the funds to do either of those things. Um, and the building that they're in is over 100 years old, um, but the areas around it, all of the other buildings, are completely unoccupied. Um, so it's sort of a, an issue of maintenance, um, what we would call um, demolition by neglect. Um, the idea that you knock down a building as um, no one lives in it, people need to live in buildings and the buildings to uh, continue to be maintained. So um, I thought that it would be really interesting to do the study towards uh, a National Register of Historic Places nomination for those um, students to learn a little bit about the building that they're in um, every day, but also to um, maybe get them some funding. Um, the Main Street Program through the Preservation Trust does really cool things, and they've done really cool things in Gainesville, actually. Um, but um, Mississippi is special in a sense because Hurricane Katrina um, actually knocked off the list a bunch of um, the previous historic buildings. And the ones that are left are recognizable. Um, Faulkner's home, for example, the old Capitol building in Jackson. Uh, places that are honestly really tied to white power, um, really tied to the 18th and 19th and 20th century infrastructure that the 1960 civil rights movement um, was trying to address. Um, there really are no civil rights sites on the register, um, and so this was a really good chance to tie preservation and building into um, the the actual civil rights movement gives something, somebody something tangible to touch, um, something that connects them and transports them back to that time. And it's really interesting that this building, before it was the Sunflower County Freedom Project, was tied to the civil rights movement, and they didn't even know it. Um, in the 1950s through the 1970s, uh, it was Parker's Pharmacy, and uh, Joel Parker was the white mayor of um, the white mayor of Sunflower, and um, the MFDP led a boycott on the railroad land across the street from Parker's Pharmacy um, because he was um, giving sharecroppers uh, goods on unfair credit um, and wasn't even letting them enter the store to get their groceries. He would leave them out back uh, for them to get while white patients were going to find. Um, and the showdown came in 1967 when uh, the MFDP um, and COFO tried to organize um, around uh, getting the all-white government in Sunflower, and remember Sunflower is about two to one African American, uh, to um, be contested by the MFDP ticket, which is all black. Um, and um, actually, well, he's gone now, but, um, yeah, was really important in that, um, and so is Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, and this was sort of uh, one of the, this was as the decline of the civil rights movement was happening, and they actually uh, 
came down and made sure that the elections were uh, monitored um, by federal officials and they still lost. Not a single MFDP, uh, not a single MFDP um, candidate was elected. Um, and there's a really interesting quote from Pio who, because um, this made national news, the fact that not a single one was elected, and this is after the success of the civil rights movement. Um, he remarked that people in the Delta have got to decide how they're going to fight for the first time in their lives. The idea was that the African Americans were being blamed for this, um, being blamed for not being able to topple the power structure that existed in this uh, commercial strip of grocery stores, public buildings, um, the power company even was in there. Um, it's basically these all white businesses that control everything in the town. And it was determined later um, through our old histories, actually. Um, I interviewed uh, Shotgun McCarty, who was uh, the former mayor of the town and then alderman, and um, chief of police, Billy Weeks, who was very open about beating um, and harassing the um, black boycotters and just also random um, farmhands that worked on Senator Eastland's land across the street. Um, and they both said that um, the problem was that the blacks were afraid that they would lose their welfare, um, that they were, they were threatened, that if they would not vote for the traditional white ticket, um, it would be taken away from them. So um, all of this stuff was just kind of unearthed during our couple days um, in Mississippi, and um, it was really cool to talk to the people at um, the uh, MFDP, not the MFDP, the um, Sunflower County Freedom Project, and let them know about it. Um, but because this is an impoverished area, um, the um, the building no longer looks the way it used to, and I can sort of pass that around. And so um, our application, interestingly, um, was denied because um, the building lacked, quote, historical integrity, meaning that the modern occupants have made too many changes to the outside of the structure. Um, and that's the way that it tends to be in uh, states like Mississippi, which has one of the lowest numbers of historic properties, uh, historic properties um, in the country versus states like New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, places like that. And so this is a really great chance for impoverished communities to get um, on the register and get funds but only if we can start to understand the intangible heritage of the civil rights movement and uh, what preserving it means, even, even moments of defeat like this, um, it's a way to transport you back um, to that movement. So that's what I have to say. They actually, it was really cool, they put on this impromptu talent show. Um, and most of them are 9th through 12th graders. I think there's about 30 of them now that they're looking towards expanding. And um, they are incredibly talented. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I can't believe that someone gave them the chance. So. When, did they, um, when did they start this? 2000, it was started through AmeriCorps, um, and it was small at first. I think it was only, I think it was like eight to 10 kids at first. And then- and not very old either. Yeah, um, so what they, um, they actually bought it from the son of the pharmacist, um, who obviously no longer needs it. And then they made um, modifications to the interior, um, drop ceilings, things that make it habitable, like air conditioning, <laughs> um, unfortunately, affect the integrity. <laughs> so. Yes, I just want to make sure people know MFDP, what you're saying. It is the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party yes. that y'all were talking about that Lawrence Guillot helped yeah. start. So he, that's why he was instrumental in it. Um, yeah, that leader organization. Um, so this was my first time going to Mississippi last September. Um, I really had no idea what to expect. It kind of 
it wasn't last minute, but I was really surprised to be invited to go on the trip. Um, I think um, what I wanted to share with you guys was just how, um, how open the civil rights activists are and how open the people in Mississippi were when we went in order to kind of just um, make our trip successful. Um, when we went touring through different historical sites, we would run into just random people who happened to be involved in the civil rights movement. And um, our tour guide was Margaret Block. Her brother was uh, Sam Block Jr. And um, they would embrace, and then we would chat, and we'd say, oh, hey, would you happen to uh, let us interview you? And most often, they would let us interview them, and we would just get great interviews and different per um, perspectives from different people. Because not everybody was actively involved in SNCC. There were other uh, forms of activism within Mississippi that kind of um, coincided. Um, it was really great. We went to the Fannie Lou Hamer Memorial site and we ran into um, Charles McLaurin, who was, um, I guess, uh, her companion at one point. Um, and just being able to um, speak to all these people. As Diana said earlier, every morning during breakfast, or right after breakfast, we would have a workshop. Um, and this year, our workshops were held with um, Brett Wynn, who was um, a SNCC member who currently lives in San Francisco, San Diego, one of the Sands. Um, we had a workshop with Dr. Alan Bean and his wife. Um, we also had a workshop with Dr. Gwendolyn um, Sahara Simmons, who is a professor at the University of Florida, and I didn't even know that she was um, a former SNCC worker. And it was really great to hear their stories and how open they are. Um, and we also met with um, attorney John Dew. And in each of their, um, in each of our morning workshops, while their stories were vastly different in how they got involved and their form of involvement, what kind of resonated um, um, or what was a common theme through all of them was just that it's not wise to just stay quiet. Um, some people are not, you know, great orators like Martin Luther King Jr., but you had people who were in the backwoods of Mississippi doing, you know, the grunt work, and it seems like their contribution sometimes is not as um, noticed as the contribution of other civil rights workers, and it was really great just to hear um, from, like, normal people like me and you every day who just go about their lives and decided that they no longer wanted to live by the status quo and they wanted to challenge it. Um, so... It was a really great privilege to meet all these people and, and to um, listen to their stories. And um, I think during our panel at Delta State was when I realized how um, important their contribution was. I think sometimes, or at least I know I did, I would think about the civil rights movement in just kind of like a, an abstract theory. But it was a movement that actually happened and there are people who are walking or are living today who um, sacrificed a lot of their lives just so we can sit in this room right now and integrate society and discuss things that maybe the government does not want us discussing. So um, I think um, it, I also realized the importance of oral history, I guess I would say, is just that you get to hear, it, it's, a, it's a biased view, but it's also that first hand, first hand account of somebody's experience not just written in textbook, but actually what somebody experienced day to day that um, truly makes a difference in understanding um, the civil rights movement in our times. Uh, uh, double question. Uh, did you go just to that town or did you get around that area of Mississippi, mainly Jackson? and? Uh, did any of the local residents you interviewed mention something called DLA? Um, we did not make it to Jackson. We stayed in the Delta area. Um, in Cleveland, we went to Sunflower. We went to, I can't pronounce it, County, uh, Tallahatchie County. Um, and we didn't get to discuss anything called DLA. Um, it's just Jackson was too far for us to travel to within our time constraints. Talk about the Black River <laughs> <laughs> we didn't talk about it then. <laughs> so, do you guys, um, do you adjust up to random people like on the street? Like, are you already honest people? 
we um one day we were visiting Taborian Hospital, which was the only um, colored hospital in um, Mount Bayou, and um, some lady just drove by and parked and came out and came to talk to us um, and said that she'd grown up in um, <clears throat> that she'd grown up in Mount Bayou and her experiences there for a while and it was just a, a, a great chat with her. Um, we ran into people everywhere it seems like who were always willing to tell us about their experiences. We also ran into people who would drive back and forth and stare at us for a while, but. It was fine. <laughs> but, uh, add stuff, but, but also there are set interviews too. I mean, y'all right. set up, right. right? Like last yeah. year, you did a lot, people did a lot with labor rights, with people in unions like the catfish yes. union workers and stuff. So there are, Y'all have a lot of interviews set up before you go. Yes, some students had um, interviews already set up and they would go, um, last year we did have the catfish interviews. Um, and then the rest of us who did not have an interview set up for that day or for that morning would go exploring and then talk to different people in the towns that we were in. And we would also set up interviews while we were there if we ran into um, somebody as well. I guess I'll kick into the last um, presentation. Um, this year was my first year going to Mississippi, and actually my first time really, I guess, venturing out in the South in general. I'm originally from Maryland, so coming down to Florida was a whole new experience, and then going to Mississippi was like going over to a whole other part of the world. <laughs> it was really eye-opening. Um, I had met some people in SNCC um, through my own excursions, but um, it was, I got a very different perspective going to Mississippi that I think was very valuable. Um, I know we talked about a lot of these names. Do any, many of y'all know what SNCC was? Everybody, you want to raise your hand? Okay, there's a lot of people that don't. Um, anybody know what SNCC was? Want to describe it briefly? Uh, it was a student movement that was, it was a civil rights movement that was built mostly out of um, a lot of student leaders in the, uh, the sit-ins. The sit-in leaders, they eventually got together, um, mostly college students, and they created the Student Civil Rights Movement that was very, very, very active all the way up until the late 60s. Correct. Correct. That's a, that's a, good, that's a good synopsis. Um, it was actually uh, founded at Shaw University, I believe, was officially. Um, and Ella Baker was seen as one of the head organizing figures, along with Howard Zinn. And um, I think it's important because those two are, are very instrumental figures in any of the oral history. You talk to anybody in SNCC. And I'll reference those people almost like they're Mother Teresa. Or, <laughs> you know, up there, I'm, I'm not the pedestal. So when I came here, I had my perception of SNCC was um, very much an international perspective. Um, a lot of you may have heard of SNCC and the work they've done in Mississippi. But after Mississippi, a lot of them actually went on to other parts of the world. Um, a few of them went to Tanzania and continued to do work. Um, some of them actually also went out to Guinea at the request of President Secretary and did organized work in Guinea before coming back to the States. So it had a very international impact. So my initial perceptions was, okay, I'm going to go to Mississippi and either hear about some of their experiences going over there or you know, have them build upon that. Um, but it was really eye-opening because a lot of these people were people who were born and raised in these communities and continued to live there after. These weren't the people that were trained and left to go on. These were the people who were from there and continued to stay there after. Um, so it was a very different perspective, but a very valuable um, invaluable perspective. Um, when I went there, I had very few expectations in general as to what we would be doing. Um, I wasn't really sure what it was going to be like. I heard a few stories from prior trips, but um, a few questions began to pop up in my own mind, which um, one was, why do people join SNCC, um, join the organization, and why did they come to Mississippi? Um, a lot of these people weren't from Mississippi. They were from northern universities, um, universities in the west and the east. And so I wanted to play for you a clip of an interview that we actually did this year from um, Mr. Bright Wynn, whose birthday it is today. Mm -hmm. Happy birthday to him, even though he's not here. Um, last I heard, he was traveling to like, Indonesia, so. Very <laughs> watching. Very watching, yes. And um, this interview was actually done during, um, during a bird watching excursion. Diana and I woke up very early in the morning. <laughs> to go bird watching with him um, while we got the interview. This is 
So this was a short clip. Uh, he tells us why he joined the um, Now, Bright Wynn is originally from California. He's a young, he was a young white man at the time. So this was a quote from him. Charles McCormick, he worked at Rubenville, and I had the scope to us. He came to my college. He was a young man, all natty up. And he spoke to the school. And he told about SNCC. And he told about growing up in the South. And he had several standing ovations because he was so honest in his speaking. And that was very, very impressive to me. And within six months, SNCC sent two other people and said, We are going to have freedom some were looking for you know, almost as if they went you. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was a good clip, and it's important because a lot of times you go to these events and people tend to leave saying, well, what can I do or what should I do as students? And a lot of you feel lost or feel, well, we have to go back and read some books. You know, you kind of, kind of out there. So I thought it was, I thought it was good to hear this because you can actually see he was, it was almost, he was like, it was almost like he was actively recruited. Um, and you get that, that sense of feeling that he felt like he had something to do. But I think it's also important that um, us as students realize, too, that it's not that one generation was more active than the next generation. It's the idea that these opportunities were out there and presented and created by people who were actively involved in this work. Um, so I think it's important that we keep that in the back of our conscience as we continue to talk about civil rights history in the future and that kind of movement. Um, and Brightman also talked to us about some of his personal stories about you know, things that were going on in California that changed his mentality about the racism that he had seen around his own communities. And so I think that's important to add to that as well. Um, but one thing that really struck me from this trip was this whole idea of almost looking at the civil rights movement, particularly in Mississippi, as war. Um, as I said, this was almost like he was being recruited. And being recruited for what? It was, you know, this activism going on in Mississippi. Um, but one of the things, um, and I think it's important because if you talk to a lot of people in SNCC, a lot of them will be referred to as veterans of SNCC and veterans of the civil, right mo civil rights movement. And I think it's hard to really conceptualize until you actually hear some of the stories about what they went through. And you really do see that it almost was like war. Um, so one of the themes that came up to me by the time I left there was this whole idea of PTSD and war experience. I have one last group I'll play also from Bright Blue. He told us. Now we were bird watching again, so there is some background noise. I found that. <laughs> One of the things that took me a long time to get over was the constant fear. You know, you never knew if somebody was going to shoot at you. You never knew if somebody was going to come up and just get the shit out of you. You never knew if anybody had killed anybody else. When you be bombed, there was constant fear. A number of things happened. Uh, we were bombed, four houses were hit in one month. It is still difficult for me to talk about the bombs. Uh, violence, hate. People afraid it's still not after it's all 48 years. It's, uh, I had not been able to put that to rest. So I think it's very important that you you know you hear these stories and you actually begin to contextualize the experiences that these people went through. And it almost is that war experience. Um, we interviewed another former state member. And she talked about the sexual violence that she had witnessed. She had actually witnessed um, a young woman um, being raped by a police officer. And that really changed her whole perception of life. Um, and it was important to me because it, a lot of these people weren't trained professionals or gone through. A lot of these were teenagers, 18, 19, maybe 20, maybe 21. So these kids, these literally, these are kids just like you all, just like us come out with this traumatic experience. And for a lot of them, it takes them time to get over it. So there's still a lot of people, like you said, that aren't able to talk about it today. And um, the after effects of that. Um, so that's something that stuck concretely with me. 
Um, also, the whole idea that this was a long tradition. These people didn't just go to Mississippi and then stop working. Um, a lot of these people continue to do work outside of this. Um, Dr. Gwendolyn, Gwendolyn Hart Simmons, who was mentioned earlier, um, she actually went to um, Friends of SNCC and joined the Friends of SNCC in New York afterwards, and then went on to join the National Council of Negro Women and do organized work around the country with them um, before coming to New York City to teach. Um, and then Bright Wynn, actually, he actually ended up going back to California, and he was involved in some organizing work to get ethnic studies in the schools in California. So it's very much a long tradition um, of organizing that goes on there. Uh, we mentioned um, racism um, and heritage, Jessica mentioned earlier. Um, I think that was my first time experiencing it, experiencing it on the ground level. I had heard some people have had difficulties in the past, you know, with getting certain sites recognized, and you can look at the numbers and see, you know, they tend to recognize Jefferson's house and George Washington's house, but other houses, you know, tend to get left off the list. But you see firsthand, you know, some of the barriers that you confront, as you're saying, a lot of these communities. Um, for whatever reason, the city or the state doesn't necessarily view them as heritage or they find ways to say it's not, um, into, it was in, the integrity is not maintained, um, and those sorts of things. But also we experienced it when we went to the site of um, Emmett Till, how the, the building supposedly where he whistled at the storekeeper, um, the marker is actually at the gas station next door because they couldn't put it on that property because that property is still privately owned and the owner doesn't want that site to be remembered. And the owner still is actively trying to keep people off of that site. Um, so I think that's important um, when you keep in mind looking at heritage over time. Um, and then finally, um, I guess future insights, there's definitely a lot of work that we can do. And, um, I like to always leave a conversation with some ideas as to what we can do next time. So one of the things I would be interested in and I think would be an interesting topic would be looking at Friends of SNCC and kind of the role that it played afterwards in terms of kind of providing an outlet for SNCC veterans to kind of leave Mississippi but continue to do SNCC related work. And then um, also just to see how local people who weren't necessarily involved in SNCC view the SNCC movement. There's a lot of people who we did interview were actively involved in the civil rights. out of their window, a white male would do that or come by in his truck and 
you know, like really angrily at us, we decided it was time to go. So <laughs> we, we dipped. But um, we saw as we were leaving that there was uh, behind a building in the town square, there were some cars that were like circling together, you know, everyone in them was talking together. And it was so strange to us because we hadn't realized how inflammatory our presence could be as a integrated mixed race group of students uh, doing our job. But that that's not, you know, being a student, doing your interviews, whatever, appreciating this historical site for its own reasons wasn't even really probably considered. It was just the presence of us as people and the color of our skin that was really upsetting to people who were there and they made their presence known in that way. So uh, that was pretty creepy. That was <laughs> so that's one thing I could point to for sure. Um, when I interviewed um, Shotgun McCarty and um, Billy Weeks, um, one of the things that struck me, because um, they're, they're both white folks and they were both part of the power structure in Sunflower during the 50s and 60s, um, was the thing that struck me was the openness with which they uh, talked about the 60s and the things that now we would consider crimes um, that would be prosecuted. Um, and um, Billy Weeks just rolled up in his red pickup truck, he's like 300 pounds, and he got out in his Crocs, and he just, he, and he, He's still alive. He was. He was. Uh, he worked for the Sovereignty Commission in the fifties. So, it's, he's a, a very large old man who just said, you know, um, in the seventies they had a uh, they had a protest against my police brutality and that I beat them up. Um, <laughs> or uh, there was another point where he beat someone to near death in broad daylight, and uh, I asked him, you know, why why do that? And he was like, because he deserved it. And so there's like this, this very like open, hateful, virulent racism. But then, Shaka McCarty um, is named such because he is tall and thin, not because of uh, his any kind of violence. He's a very peaceful, kind of quiet man. But um, he um, he and I were talking, and he was like, "Yeah, I really want to help you with this." And I was like, "Yeah, that's really nice to hear." And then he said, "You know, it's better that they're in that building doing than doing." what they would be doing normally, referring to black children um, and you know, stereotypes about you know, black culture and things like that. And that's a different kind of racism. Um, and so the question is like, do we claim these people as on our side? Or like, what, what do we do with these people that grew up in the 30s and 40s that still, that their attitude is still here and they're, they're doing something that's kind of paternalistic um, but you know what, it was Shotgun McCarty that met the historic preservation officer when he came out to Sunflower. Um, and he did it for all the wrong reasons. Um, it's kind of complicated. Uh, one day while we were in um, Margaret Block's house, um, I was browsing around at her pictures and I noticed she had a picture of KKK members burning a cross. And I asked her, why would you keep such a picture like hanging in her kitchen of all places in her home that she lives in by herself, by the way? And she says that she uses it to remember. Um, but she also said that it's also a reminder that the work is not done. That picture was taken in 2007. So it was a recent um, action of the KKK in just half an hour away from where we were. Um, still up to their old tricks. So that um, still sticks with me to think about, um, you know, racism, covert or over, I mean, covert racism, whatever is around, but um, actually, you know, continuing practices of that time, it didn't seem like it was still going on, but it is. Especially that, um, which we mentioned like that, just seems so old fashioned. It does. And the fact that it happened, that it keeps up in the it's very hard to stick picture that. Uh, in the, and to both the teams again, I know this year was uh, Cleveland High School, Panola High School, and two parochial schools that were pretty well blended. And uh, it, it was spontaneous, so they made sure that the pictures, the people in the picture were you know, nicely mixed up. It wasn't like separating the pictures. So 
Uh, do you know what was happening in those schools different from all those other ones, those two just in some very heavy populated, very mixed areas? Uh, for the schools, I guess you can't predict because the kids come from all over the place. The, the public schools are district. So why Panola and Cleveland look so well blended at least in the picture of the team and everybody else? My guess would be that because Cleveland seems to be like a large metropolitan type area, that would be why there was such diversity. And for open schools, listen, if you're going to recruit and you're going to win, you're going to do what you got to do. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so we eventually guess that um, Delta State was in Cleveland. And so a lot of places where you do find universities, <coughs> you'll find university professors with their students. And you tend to find a little bit more integration when they as compared to it. Yeah. You know what thing about that? I don't. I don't know. But one of the things that I think is the competitors. Just to go in a similar vein, um, two things I experienced in Mississippi that really hit me were um, one, seeing prisoners doing um, menial work around the community, such as picking up the trash and things that would normally be somebody's job. And it really helped me to conceptualize this whole idea of a prison industrial complex and the idea that prisoners are doing it and somebody's getting paid off of it, but you can be sure it's not them. Um, so, and you get to see, we, we pass by Parchment, the uh, very large prison complex that literally hires out prisoners for very, very little money to them. But of course, the prisoners make large amounts of money off of their labor. Um, the other thing that struck me was um, black people picking cotton in 2012. And that's something I never thought I would see. But it definitely happens. A lot of it is machine operated, but people, if they're not in the machine, it's black people picking the cotton. And so that is me. To piggyback off of what he said, to see, um, it wasn't so much the shock of seeing black people picking cotton. It was, I never, like you hear picking cotton, pick cotton. I didn't know what that kind of entails, pick cotton. But the cotton branches are really low. It's Backbreaking menial labor to think that it's yeah it's it doesn't seem pleasant at all and that that really shocked me kind of struck. Yeah. Well, one of your one of your pictures was of a huge mound. Uh, what was that mound? Okay, I think that was the the big green Winterville. Mm -hmm. Winterville, yeah. Okay, when when we went on when we were interviewing. Margaret Blash took us on a tour of the Delta and sites that she thought would be significant to our research and that sort of thing. So that included civil rights sites, but also cultural sites in Mississippi that she wanted to gain more attention. So these are the Winterville Indian Mounds, <coughs> and that is from the Mississippian tribes that were there hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And one of the things that Margaret Black really wanted us to take away from that was that Mississippi also isn't just about struggle and strife and civil rights and blues, because that is a rich history and there's much to learn there. But there's also a lot of significant sites in the Mississippi culture that don't gain enough significance. And she wanted it to be known that her experience wasn't just uh, living in Mississippi and growing up there wasn't just as a black woman or a person who worked in the civil rights movement, but she really loved her state and she loved the land there and she loved the history of everything that came before it. And she wanted us to understand more about that rather than just a couple buzzwords maybe that more people are familiar with in that state. So she took us on a tour and it was really cool. Is that a friend who's climbing one? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, reading out me a couple of things, I mean, I think Margaret was trying I mean, I wanted to dovetail on what Dad was saying. She was trying to emphasize to us that black history and Native American history are very much intertwined. Also, I think that was one of the themes. Uh, James Meredith, who many of you recognized who integrated in the University of Mississippi, uh, was raised in a black Choctaw environment. And his mother raised him very uh, systematically to emphasize those two elements of his culture, African and Native American. And the other thing, he got that, that museum in the mounds was incredible. These are mounds that predate the Aztec Empire. 
And in the flood of 1927, when the Mississippi over, overflowed its, overflowed its uh, banks by 50 miles, literally, um, those are the only structures that kept people from drowning. Uh, all the buildings, all the houses, concrete, wood, were just wiped out. And so families were able to actually use those mounds as sanctuary uh, to survive the 27 flood. And I think you're right. I think Margaret wanted us to see this other version of, of history. The other thing that people there take great pride in is that people use the mounds to defend themselves from the Europeans as they were coming up the river in, in, in the early 1500s. Uh, and they would, you know, they would shoot people from the mounds, they would you know, send out war canoes, uh, and so it's, it's a very rich uh, history. Um, I guess my question is, uh, in the couple of years that you guys have been going to the Delta, like, have you seen any difference? Have you seen, like, any progress uh, and as, as it relates to your work? Um, and uh, not just in terms of like preserving history and like making people aware of it, because I'm sure it's had a huge impact on like local African American communities, but has it had any effect on integrating, you know, the communities, you know, you know, like maybe the football teams that are a little more mixed as opposed to the ones that are a little more segregated or, um. The work that we do in Mississippi isn't necessarily like well publicized or covered in newspapers there so the information isn't it's not like we're on tv stations or anything like talking to people it's more about the people that we actually meet with in person so we get to talk to the kids at McComb, and we get to talk to the kids at sunflower uh, and we get to talk to all the activists who worked before so i haven't noticed any communities becoming like more peaceful <laughs> or something, or like happy. Uh, <clears throat> but there are more kids going to the school in Sunflower. And the and we who come back from Mississippi really feel attached to it and pay attention to what's going on there. So that's probably the biggest impact for me that I can speak to. Yes, I can throw out two examples. I'm Sarah, and uh, last year was my fourth year on the trip. So what Diana just mentioned about the Sunflower County Freedom Project, we visit them every year, and the year before this group went, um, there were probably 11 kids hanging around the building. And these 11 kids blew our minds. They were so impressive, just because they're so disciplined and so supportive of each other. So this year, we were really excited to go back and bring this whole group back, because last time it was only half of us. And when we got there, it was like 40 kids. And, and the, you know, the, the whole, the, they were all still organized and everything was still functioning, but the program had grown so much because of the, the success that they had in that smaller group of kids just one year before. And then another example is um, two years ago when I went, we visited a museum called the Emmett Till Histor Historic Intrepid Center, which the acronym is EPIC. And it was a, a museum started in Glendora by people in the community there. And it was built into a, an old cotton gin building. And it was very much like the, the, the exhibits were on like display boards that you'd see at a science fair, but you could still tell that people really cared a lot about it. And then the year after that, being last year that we went on the trip, they received federal funding and a team of advisors to put together like a real quality museum. And last year we got to go to the opening of that. And it was all the same people from the community that we had met the year before. And it was the same site and everything, but this museum was now like taken seriously and, and truly impressive and something that everyone could be proud of and also use as a local resource. But in the background of all this, I have to say, I haven't seen very much institutional improvement in Mississippi. So it's mostly community driven and, and that's what we're there to document. Yeah. I, I think one of the things, too, is that I mean, there's two groups of people now that really expect us to come back and want us and urge us to come back to Mississippi. And that is people like Morris Dion and Margaret Block, community organizers, and, but also educators. And, because it's, and they tell us, look, when we have outsiders coming in and confirming the fact that African American history and civil rights movement history matters, it makes things so much easier for us as teachers in public schools or professors at universities on the Mississippi Valley, where it's still controversial to teach African American history. Um, we 
we see changes that are occurring, but a lot of those are incremental changes. They're changes in history and the way that Mississippians tell their narrative. Every year that we, that we return, we see new markers. There may just be one or two. Uh, this year, we heard mention of the Daniel Hamer statue at Park. That was a big deal in Mississippi. Um, and in some ways, Mississippi has leapfrogged over the state of Florida. Because now there are more civil rights markers and monuments in the state of Mississippi than there are in the state of Florida. And we have to ask ourselves why that is. Uh, it's because, you know, really excellent community organizers with Bald and Smith, they became parents, they became grandparents, as Echo and Justin was saying, most of them were local people. And so now they're at the age where they're saying, hey, we want this curriculum in our schools. And to get curriculum in the schools, we have to get some physical sites. And I think at the Civil Rights Museum, as a historian, obviously, I love museums, right? <laughs> but look, folks, the fact that the state of Mississippi is putting resources into building a civil rights museum in Jackson, Jackson, Mississippi, the heartland of a white citizens council, that is an enormous breakthrough, not just for Mississippians, but for the entire nation. We do not have a civil rights museum of that stature in the state of Florida. So again, Mississippi has found a way, even though there, as, as we know, there's a lot of problems there, they're leapfrogging. I mean, they're not just leapfrogging past Florida, they're light years ahead of us. And I think as educators and community organizers, we have to ask ourselves, we have to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, well, why is this? Uh, history plays a huge role in, in social change. And I think that, that it's no secret that, or no mistake, that so many of the former SNCC organizers are the ones that really, I mean, they, they start calling us, they, they're already calling us, and saying, let's talk about next fall, right? Because we want to make sure that we're all coming. Well, I'd like to say they pay their own way, too. I mean, people say, why, I say, why can't you get all those great people to come to U.S., Paul? Why do you? Why do all the work for Delta State, for the people in that area? People are flying from all over to come participate and be part of it and mostly pay in their own way. Yeah, they pay their own way and they don't want to come to the U.S. They want to be there in the Delta to talk about and to meet with the people there too. And, you know, so it's, it's a very cool Y'all should go closer. It's a long drive. How long is the drive, Mosley? <laughs> 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 Sorry, I'm sorry. Is it 12, 14 hours? Yeah, 14. Yeah, it's like 14. 14 would be good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we might get timing this year, though. Yeah. Oh, yes. This question is a little more on a personal note for you. Going to Mississippi and doing civil rights work, or civil rights movement history, even, uh, parents your own you might find a little dicey. What, what's been the holiday discussions at the table about this work that you're doing with your education? And, and, and interesting discussions may be coming from that. Um, my mom was a little skeptical. Um, but in the end, she, she let me go. And then when I came back and I told her about what I learned, she was, um, she was really supportive about it. Because um, I come from a Haitian household, but my mom, I guess, would, I would say is very Canadianized because she grew up in Canada. So I didn't get to know a lot about my Haitian ancestry or a lot about my African-American ancestry because I grew up in a Jewish neighborhood. So I think she was just really happy to see me learning something different. Um, when I told her that I'd want to go back to Mississippi, possibly <laughs> to live, that's when the conversation got yeah. a little awkward. <laughs> um, but I'm like, don't worry, I graduated in years, but not quite then. So that was the only thing. <laughs> My mom doesn't know what I did. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't tell I went to Mississippi until after it happened. <laughs> and then even then, I didn't describe what I did. I My parents were like, oh man, like, why are you going there? And what is there to see there, really? Um, they were just really, you know, supportive, like, go do your thing, Diana. But, 
uh, my dad shared with me that he was like, oh, okay. And the only thing he could really relate to that was, I remember when drinking fountains were segregated, which blew my mind. Like, it's my dad. But, uh, and that was, that means it was a really short time ago. So that was more, just, you know, like more context for me. It was only 40 years ago. You know, it was only 40 or 50 years ago. But then my parents are, you know, this is the second year I've been, and they're like, are you going again? You know, I don't know about your, your sweet feeling sort of thing. But I keep going. <laughs> He doesn't, um, he was actively against, um, but you know, I'm 24, I can do what I want. Um, but um, we've actually, um, my friends and I have started collecting um, supplies for the Freedom Project in Sunflower. And um, I was telling my mom, you know, like how, like, I was really excited about it. And, and um, my brother walked into the room. And she and he was like, oh, what y'all talking about? And I was like, and my mom said, oh, just them Mississippi and word. And so um, oh. I, um, oh. I don't, we don't talk about it anymore. <laughs> One of the things we wanted to really encourage folks to do um, is we take, we really try to document the trips and take. The students take a lot of wonderful photographs, and these are some of the, the panels of, of some of those photographs of uh, places that um, students have been describing. And also, we're beginning to make the interviews we've done in Mississippi and other places really accessible. And on the brochures or spot pamphlets, you'll see the way out there's uh, links to our, uh, our website. And um, you can actually click and listen to these interviews, uh, Deborah Hendricks, who's our wonderful technical coordinator, is on the camera. Um, we should always acknowledge Deborah. <laughs> we call the Spot TV channel. It's a, it's a YouTube channel, and you can watch the entire organizing workshop from Lawrence Dion on there. You can see interviews that we've done with Black Seminoles, with uh, survivors of World War II, and, and I love the metaphor that Justin threw out about veterans, um, because we have not only military veterans who liberated uh, Nazi concentration camps, survivors of, of German POW camps, survivors of the Tan Death March, civil rights veterans, um, uh, pioneering students at the University of Florida, uh, but these are the types of, of narratives and stories that you can hear when you click into the web, our website, the YouTube channel. So we really encourage you to, to get involved in or most your program, even if you don't go to, to the UF, you know, think about a project in your community. Think about people like Melanie Barr, who's doing wonderful work um, in, in terms of preserving and promoting African American history uh, in Gainesville. Uh, think about a person like Joe Porter and the CMC, who's doing amazing work in preserving and promoting activist uh, history uh, in, our, in our community. We have, we're blessed in Gainesville with having a lot of people in, in the historical, I call them the historical movement people. Uh, because they're not generally paid professionals, but they're people that believe in the power of history. And again, the thing I like to emphasize is the importance of history and social change. If you don't know where you came from, if you don't know where your community came from, if you don't know where it started from, you will never be able to change that community, uh, either at a local level or statewide or national level. So um, now that's just kind of my editorial to, to, to check us out. Mm -hmm. um, we're very proud in Samuel Project Wall Street Program to have this level of outstanding students, uh, but also community support. People like Joe, people like Melanie, people like Robbie, who are our sustainers in the community. People like Callie Blunt, who is an educator of outstanding rank and teaches courses here on African and African American history. Uh, who you should, if you have that opportunity to check out one of his courses, you should very much uh, do so. I'm a history professor at all, so I tend to wrap, uh, <laughs> but I'll give it back to you guys. If anyone else has any questions. Oh, she was sorry, I have another <laughs> comment. I transcribed an interview of right when a previous one, he sobs at the end of the interview. It, he's still very traumatized by what happened there. Um, 
And also, Paul, a uh, professor Paul had at Duke was also people came to recruit and hit it when he was in college. And when it came time, he got on the bus, and then when they started talking about the people, and Bright Wind talks about that on the way to Mississippi, they had heard about people who had just been killed there, where he was going. And Paul's professor got off the bus. He said, I'm not prepared to die. So it really, when you hear the interviews, you really should go and listen. I mean, I was, I was crying when I was transcribing his interview. It was, it's still very real to him what he saw there and what he knew was happening to people, so. And also, generally, um, the Samuel Bartow <laughs> History Program takes volunteers and interns every semester, so if you're interested in getting involved, it's like, through the volunteers and the interns that people go on the trip, so. Like some Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Uh, the, the people that you interviewed there who had been involved, um, did they talk about it being more fearful because of their specific tactic that is not about the idea that not only were they facing danger, but they couldn't fight to protect themselves? And did any of them say anything like, uh, I wouldn't turn in like another, I wouldn't turn another cheek today? Did they, did, they, did they talk about that fear, and fear back then, and any change in their yeah, Brent went during his interview, um, he specifically talked about that topic. He said he was very adamant about nonviolence, so he himself was nonviolent. Um, but he said individuals within SNCC were not the same way necessarily. He knew people in SNCC that would actually carry guns with them wherever they went. Margaret. Yeah, Margaret I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> Margaret Vlog said that she does not believe in nonviolence. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a direct quote from an interview. She yeah. did not accept that as a personal. Yeah, and he also mentioned the fact that, um, I guess when Stokely Carmichael gave his interview and mentioned the fact that um, he used nonviolence as a tactic, he said that really blew the lid off of SNCC and the whole idea that it was the first time publicly where people were saying, well, SNCC could be nonviolent potentially and it could potentially be nonviolent. So there were people within SNCC who were very against the whole idea of I need to be nonviolent. And as far as fear, I was going to say, when I spoke to Margaret Block, I got the idea that they didn't really think about fear too often in, in terms of like what they were doing. It was kind of like a thing in the back of your mind, not something you thought about all the time um, through day-to-day -day activities, at least. And Brett was very different. He said he thought about fear all the time. And, <laughs> and everything that they did, they tried to do things to make sure that they wouldn't start commotion. So when they did drive in an integrated situation, the blacks would sit in the back, the whites would sit up front. And so they they they, they ended up in a right right so they did things to maintain some type of something I noticed in your presentation was you mentioned that I think one of the projects in Mississippi was started with AmeriCorps money. You know, sometimes the right wing doesn't like the government doing things for the people like this. and uh, this is a case where the government did to help facilitate something like it for the people. We have an event here next Monday. It's a showing of a film called Soul of the People, and it's about the Federal Writers Project, which was done in the Depression, coming out of the Depression, to give writers and artists a chance to do work and also go out and document first-hand history. <clears throat> One of the featured people in that film is Stetson Kennedy, for whom uh, we have part of our library is named because he donated over 2,000 books. He's an amazing uh, figure in the civil rights movement and in Florida history in general. Uh, currently, there is an exhibit at the Oak Hall School out on Tower Road. It will be there until February 9th. We just had the opening on Friday night. And it has pictures from Stetson's life. He worked directly with Zora Neale Hurston on the Works Progress Administration. He'd been a UF student for a short time, got away from that, and went out and did um, all kinds of stuff in his life, uh, in, including getting into the Ku or infiltrating the Ku Klux Klan and disrupting their organization in the 40s. So it's an amazing exhibit of art and, and things from Woody Guthrie and stuff. So I really want people to try to get out to Oak Hall. I think they have daytime hours on the gallery out there. Eight to, uh, one, eight to four Monday through Friday. Eight to four Monday through Friday. And as I say, the exhibit closes February 9th. But next Monday evening, we'll have Soul of the People Here. It's a film uh, recent for public broadcasting. And we're hoping that Stetson Kennedy's uh, uh, ex-wife or widow, uh, Sandra Park, will be here to talk about Stetson and the film because he's heavily featured in that.
that. So do come back. Thank you all for doing this. And that's yeah. next Monday, the 21st at 7 p.m. Uh, we have cookies and brownies over here provided generously from Sheila. And if you will uh, just sign our sign in sheet.